just over two centuries ago, Daniel Boone was one of the first to venture into the unknown lands west of America's East Coast settlements. But he soon found himself struggling through a daunting wilderness, mile upon mile of forested ridges and valleys, an ancient chain of mountains that runs all the way down the eastern side of the continent. The Appalachians. As Daniel Boone fought his way westwards through the Cumberland Gap, he found himself in an endless forest, teeming with wildlife. He was passing through some of the richest temperate forests anywhere on the planet. But this land wasn't just a wilderness for the taking. People already lived here. People with a very different view of this forest world. They called themselves Aniyunwia, the real people. But to the rest of the world, they would soon be known as Cherokee. The Aniyunwia were bound to these forests to the mountains, plants, and animals in many ways, both practical and spiritual. We Cherokee cannot separate our place on earth from our lives in it, nor from our vision and meaning as people. We are taught that the trees and even the plants and animals that we share a place with are our brothers and sisters. So when we speak of land, we do not speak of property, territory, or even the piece of ground upon which our house is set and our crops are grown. We are speaking of something truly sacred. The Cherokee have an ancient relationship with these mountains. According to their own history, they came here a long time ago from a world above this one. In the beginning, the Cherokee were in Galanlade, or heaven, and peeped through a hole down to see the earth. At this time, the earth was nothing but wet, shapeless mud. So they sent Turkey Vulture, the great buzzard, to find somewhere dry enough for the Cherokee to live. And as he flew over the land looking for dry land, he became tired and his wings began to touch the earth, which scooped up and formed the mountains in which the Cherokee live today. Southern Appalachians. Ridge piled upon ridge like waves in a sea of trees, raised by the buzzard's wings. But the creation story that geologists tell is just as wonderful. Once these mountains rivaled the Himalayas, but time, hundreds of millions of years of it, have worn this once mighty chain down to its roots, roots that are ancient beyond comprehension. 
Some of the rocks here are more than a billion years old, nearly a quarter of the age of the Earth itself. These ancient rocks were pushed into towering peaks 250 million years ago, when Africa collided with North America, a time when all the continents were fusing into a single supercontinent called Pangaea. But this mountain chain is not just ancient, it's also vast. It stretches from Georgia and Alabama in the south to Newfoundland in the north. And on the ancient continent of Pangaea, it went further still. As the supercontinent broke apart, it carried fragments of the great mountain chain around the globe. Today, those lost sections of the Appalachians form the mountains of Scandinavia and Scotland. And 250 million years later, perhaps that's why Scots-Irish immigrants felt so at home in these mountains. They were moving from one end of the ancient Appalachians to the other. Here, in isolated homesteads, their own traditions began to evolve and help shape the unique culture of modern Appalachia. Life was hard for the first settlers in these remote valleys, but there were rewards, like the breathtaking spectacle of an Appalachian fall, a season of abundance for people and wildlife. But for a long time, there were few settlers here to witness Appalachia's passing seasons. The endless ridges and valleys were simply too inaccessible. The Cherokee could still travel unheeded through their vast hunting territory, all the way from modern Georgia to Kentucky. They farmed fields along the river valleys, but also relied on the abundance of the forests. Large animals were hunted with bows. But for small game, they used a blowgun made from river cane. Deadly, up to 30 meters. Hunter and hunted are bound by intimate ties. For a Cherokee, there is no distinction between the practical and the spiritual, because the Creator has imbued all life in this forest with a divine spark. Everything has a soul. So a hunter should always say a prayer for the hunted. And in return, animals will give up their lives to respectful hunters. The Cherokee year begins in the fall, 
which all too soon turns to the season they call the sleep time. Autumn becomes winter. A stark sunrise through skeletal trees heralds the harshest time of the year for all life here. People, plants, and animals. Turkey vultures, seen by the Cherokee as distant descendants of the great buzzard that made these mountains, now gather in roosts to pass the cold nights. They greet each dawn with outspread wings to warm themselves, ready for flight and the daily search for food. Someone else's hardship is the vulture's good fortune. Turkey vultures find food by smell, so have little trouble finding even the smallest casualties of a freezing night. Many animals, from chipmunks to bears, are hidden in winter dens, but a few ghostly shapes still move through the freezing fog. It's in winter that the remote peaks and valleys feel most isolated. The high ridges are often shrouded in cold, damp clouds. A hard time for wild turkeys and white-tailed deer, searching for the last of the fall harvest. But winter doesn't last forever. The slightest hint of spring on a chilly March evening, and life begins to stir on the forest floor. But the slow return of warmth is only one ingredient in the alchemy of spring. The other is rain. The first wet night in March and the forest floor is alive with male spotted salamanders. They're all heading downhill, certain that they'll eventually run into one of the forest pools that fill with early spring rain. A few nights later, and the females join them.
Despite near freezing water, a mass spawning, a salamander orgy, is underway. And on the next wet night, they will all abandon the pond and disappear back into the forest, leaving their eggs to whatever fate awaits them. As March becomes April, warmer days begin to rouse the forest itself. Wake, oh, wake, you drowsy sleeper. Wake, oh, wake, it is almost day. The dead greys of winter are now suffused with living green. Those that pass the cold season in warm dens begin to wake. Yona, the black bear, is special to the Cherokee. He was once a Cherokee child that spent so long living in the forest that he grew long black hair and slowly turned into a bear. Every spring since then, Yona has introduced a new generation of bears to the mountain forests. Cubs are born in January in their mother's winter den, and that has been their whole world until now. Less than a week out of the den, life in the forest is new and exciting. Spring comes first to the valley floors and sweeps up the mountains as a green tide. While the valleys bask in late spring, the higher ridges are still shaking off the last chills of winter. And now the Appalachians put on their most flamboyant display. Carpets of wild flowers soak up the spring sunshine before the light is cut off by awakening trees. But this display of plants is not just a dazzling spectacle. It's nature's pharmacy. Traditionally, the Cherokee knew medicinal or practical uses for more than 700 different varieties of plants in these mountains. And more importantly still, plants help maintain the delicate, practical and spiritual balance between the Cherokee and the animals they hunted. When the Cherokee first came upon the earth, they were welcomed by the animals and the plants. But after the Cherokee began to expand, 
then uh, they became arrogant and began to think that everything was placed there for them. We were given prayers to say and ask permission to kill the animals, but we forgot those prayers. Then the animals had a council. Each of the animals came in front of the bear and the wolf who were chiefs to voice their complaints. And as a result, the animals then, in order to get back up on the Cherokee, each one of the animals had a specific disease in which they gave to the Cherokee. But the plants who were friends with the Cherokee saw this and then began to offer themselves as medicines to cure those, those illnesses. And the plants seem to have been as good as their word. Modern medicine has found some 250 different drugs in plants growing in the southern Appalachians. Many generations of Cherokee have lived their lives here, tuned to the pulse of the seasons, a rhythm of life more ancient by far than even the Cherokee people. Every spring, for years beyond reckoning, rain has filled the forest pools. And every spring, a succession of creatures emerges from the forest to breed here. American toads are among the last to arrive. By now, the spotted salamander spawn is ready to hatch. The eggs have turned green, coated with algae that help provide oxygen to the growing embryos. But the toads don't seem to like this particular pond. They can sense chemicals in the water that tell them it's a bad idea to spawn here. Chemicals from these tadpoles, of wood frogs. The wood frogs bred even earlier than the salamanders, and the pond is now swarming with their tadpoles. But these cute little tadpoles are killers. They devour the spawn of other amphibians, but they're especially fond of toad spawn. The occasional toad does make a mistake, and its precious spawn is soon a feeding frenzy of hungry wood frog tadpoles. Now summer finally reaches the high peaks and a green canopy closes over the forest floor. Summer flowers, like milkweeds, brighten the glades and attract all kinds of bugs. And the bugs attract birds with hungry chicks to feed, bluebirds and purple martins. The Cherokee used to hang hollow gourds in their fields, nest sites for the colonial martins. And in return, the martins would feed their chicks on insects that would otherwise eat the Cherokee crops. It's a tradition that many people still carry on today. So much so that purple martins here no longer use natural sites. Early summer is a tough time for parents of any size. Bear cubs are dependent on their mother's milk for most of their first carefree summer.
Life in the mountains is in full swing. Liberty, liberty makes you fly so high. My true love, she lives up in the sky. By late afternoon, it's hot enough to make well-fed cubs drowsy. The summer forests are just as magical by night. New life is everywhere. Possums are marsupials, and mothers carry their young hidden in a pouch. But by early summer, they're just too big and have to ride piggyback. So far, these young flying squirrels have spent their life safe in a hollow, high above the forest floor. But now, the forest beckons. The possums are also old enough to explore the forest on their own and leave their mother for good. But there couldn't be more of a contrast between the plodding possum and the agile squirrel. Even young flying squirrels move with sure-footed confidence. And distance is no object. A flap of skin between their legs acts as a gliding membrane, allowing them to glide up to 30 meters through the forest night. But possums have to explore the hard way. The sheer size of these forests is astounding. And so is their diversity. There are more kinds of trees in the southern Appalachians than in the whole of Europe. Though for some, one tree is as good as the next. Jonas' cubs have grown quickly. By midsummer, they're as confident in the trees as they are on the forest floor.
there are sheltered glades scattered throughout the forest where a young bear can warm himself in the sun. Here, the grass grows thicker and draws in white-tailed deer with their young fawns. Some of these glades were created by the Cherokee. Over the centuries, they burned patches of forest to encourage the growth of grass, which in turn attracted deer and made them easier to hunt. But the animals that brought the Cherokee life would soon bring death. In the 18th century, fur traders penetrated the mountains and drew the Cherokee into a suicidal trade. Now, instead of hunting for their own needs, they were given guns to hunt for the distant and insatiable European market in hides and furs. The slaughter was unimaginable. At the height of the fur trade in the middle of the 18th century, Cherokee hunters sent five million deer skins to the coastal markets for export. The unthinkable was happening. The Cherokee had long ago been taught that they were kin to all life in the forest, but now they were helping to exterminate their brothers and sisters. And the settlers continued the slaughter. The last wolf was finally silenced in the 1920s. No one knows when the last mountain lion was killed, or even if, hopefully, a few secretive individuals still hide in the endless forest. As the Cherokee destroyed their own livelihood for trade, they became more and more dependent on European, and later, American goods. Their ancient culture was being eroded. But only a few could see it, like Skia Gunsta, a headman of the lower towns. What are we red people? The clothes we wear, we cannot make ourselves. They are made to us. We use the ammunition with which we kill deer. We cannot make our guns, they are made to us. Every necessary thing in life we must have from the white people. But increasing dependence was only part of their problem. The Cherokees had always known the practical and spiritual dangers of indiscriminate hunting. Now it seemed as if that ancient council of animals met one more time to carry out their threat to punish all who left the path of respect, sending disease to devastate the tribe. In 1738, smallpox, carried by European traders, swept through the Cherokee, and half the nation died. The local plants held no cure for this new disease. Medicine men and women watched helplessly as 20,000 and Ian Weir died. The slaughter of so many animals and the deaths of so many people changed Appalachia forever. Bison occurred in small numbers throughout the mountains, but when so many people and other animals disappeared, bison numbers increased. They show just how delicate the balance of life really is in these forests. More and more bison turned areas around water holes into vast seas of mud, and hundreds of hooves trampled wide trails through the forests. So impressive that later settlers often used these as their own trails, and later still made them into roads.
But the bison didn't last long. A tide of new people, settlers and farmers, would soon sweep down through the mountains, and the bison would join the wolf and the mountain lion. Change is nothing new to these ancient mountains. They've seen ice ages come and go. They've seen continents glide over the face of the globe. And during that time, far greater forces than humanity have shaped these mountains, including the greatest of all, water. Summer brings heavy storms. Remnants of Atlantic or Gulf of Mexico hurricanes dump enormous quantities of rain on the mountains, up to 10 inches in a single day. Some parts of the southern Appalachians are amongst the wettest places on the continent. The forests here really are temperate rain forests. Rain feeds streams, which in turn feed rivers. And these have slowly worn away the rocks and eroded the parallel valleys so characteristic of these mountains. landscape of the Blue Ridge, carved by ever-present water. Rivers and streams are everywhere in Cherokee country. And according to Cherokee legend, the deeper pools hide monsters, the giant snake-like creature they call Uktena. And there really are monsters here. The Helgramite, a giant insect larva. It reaches 10 centimeters in length, its body lined with pulsating filaments. Gills to extract oxygen from the water. And at its tail, sturdy grappling hooks stop it being washed away in the powerful current. An even bigger monster, the Hellbender, a giant salamander that can reach half a meter in length. Yet this monstrous salamander has even bigger relatives in China and Japan. With its nearest relatives living on another continent, Hellbenders are a reflection of the ancient history of these mountains, recalling a time when Asia and America were all part of a single continent. And it's not just hellbenders that echo the days of Pangaea. In high summer, the hills are covered in rhododendrons, more usually associated with the mountains of Asia. But this, the Catawba rhododendron, is uniquely Appalachian, found nowhere else, a relic of the deep history of their mountain home. But a new chapter in that quarter of a billion year history was now beginning. By 1790, 80,000 settlers vastly outnumbered the remaining Cherokee. They just won their independence from the British Crown, and the new nation had a manifest destiny that would drive them ever westwards and Appalachia witnessed the final meeting between two very different cultures, summed up with poignant accuracy at the end of the 18th century by a Cherokee leader called Corn Tassel. The creator 
has given each their lands. He has stocked yours with cows, ours with buffalo, yours with hogs, ours with bear, yours with sheep, ours with deer. He has indeed given you an advantage in this, that your cattle are tame and domesticated, while ours are wild and demand not only a large space for a range, but art to hunt and kill them. It was clear that these two worldviews could not exist side by side, and the Cherokee had made a big political mistake. Some had fought with the British in the War of Independence, and the retribution of the Americans would be absolute. As the North Carolina delegation to the Continental Congress put it, their mission was to extinguish the very race of them, and scarce to leave enough of their existence to be a vestige in proof that the Cherokee nation once was. In 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act to force the relocation of Eastern Indians to Oklahoma, west of the Mississippi. And in the depths of the brutal winter of 1838, the Cherokee were rounded up and marched out of their forest home. It was done in the wintertime to lower the, the possibility of uh, resistance because they took away the food, they took away all the warmth, all the clothing. The removal, which took six months from here to Oklahoma, we lost about, I guess, about a quarter of our entire population on that removal. And that's why it's called Zunizohilain, uh, is literally where they cried. Today it's called the Trail of Tears. But a few Cherokee escaped into the mountains, where they were protected by the vastness of the forest. But soon the forest themselves would be under threat. They held a valuable resource for an expanding nation, timber. By the mid-1880s, the mountain wilderness had been penetrated by railroads and the means to transport timber to build the cities of America. In these once isolated ancient forests, loggers were amazed by the sheer size of the trees they found. In the 40-year timber boom that followed, great areas of the forest were laid waste. But it gradually became clear that, in the face of a logging frenzy by profiteering lumber companies, these forests were far from endless. Yet the growing environmental disaster at the end of the 19th century provoked a response, and the Southern Appalachians became the birthplace of forestry in the New World. Vast tracts of devastated land were bought up by the newly formed Forest Service, land that would eventually become the National Forests. Much of this was driven by the vision of one man, Gifford Pinchot, the first of the practical conservationists. He saw that conservation is the foresighted utilization, preservation, and or renewal of forests, waters, lands, and minerals for the greatest good of the greatest number of people for the longest time. Yet in a sense, he was only restating how the Cherokee lived in these mountains. 
They needed the forests for their survival, so it made sense to use them with care. They long ago realized that they didn't inherit the mountains from their ancestors, they borrowed them from their children. Over the last hundred years, much of the devastated forest has grown back, though not yet in the majesty of the old growth. But most of the natural cycles here are still intact. And as fall marks the start of another Cherokee year, the forest still offers its bounty to all who live here. A harvest of nuts falls from the canopy. Acorns from a dozen different kinds of oak, walnuts, hickory nuts. In a good year, half a ton of acorns alone can fall on each hectare of forest floor. Gray squirrels are busy now, hoarding as much as they can. They know that winter is just around the corner. Late autumn mists sweep down from the peaks, a reminder that the good times are almost over. The bear cubs are almost unrecognizable now. They're huge. Fueled by the autumn abundance, they can put on more than three kilos a day. They're programmed to keep eating. In preparation for winter, their physiology has changed, and they always feel hungry, no matter how much they eat. Soon they'll follow their mother to her sheltered den, until spring once again wakes the forest. Yona is still part of these endless cycles. And to greet her next spring, there are still Cherokees here too, in the forests that gave birth to their culture. Descendants of those that hid from the soldiers. Now, people like Eddie Bushyhead are working hard to see that Cherokee language and culture will remain as vital a part of Appalachia as bears or trees. The mountains are never ugly. Everything is the way that the Creator wanted it to be. And being here in the mountains, you're able to see that. It manifests itself. These mountains have endured for longer than any human mind can grasp. The last century of their history has shown that nature is resilient. It will always triumph in the long term. But it's in the short time scale of humanity that we need to safeguard the future of these forests for our own sakes and for our own spirits. See you.